Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Our speaker for this evening is Professor Robert Whitaker, who's Professor of Biogeography and Director of Graduate Studies in the School of Geography and the Environment at Oxford University. Um, he's the author of more than 140 scientific papers and several books, several of which are actually um, iconic in the field. He's the editor-in-chief of, of an integrated journal called Frontiers in Biogeography. And as you can guess from this, his interest and exper expertise is in biogeography, that study of where organisms live, where they come from, and how they move around. And his special interest for a very long time and the focus of his current research has been on islands and about the assembly of biotas on islands and, and how that works. And tonight he's going to speak to us on life on islands, cycle of arrival, change, and loss. So over to you, Robert, and you may share your screen. So thanks very much, Sandy. Thanks to, thanks to the Linnaean Society for inviting me and um, welcome everybody. Today I'm going to attempt to sketch out some outlines of how island life assembles on islands, how the biological dynamics interact with the earth system dynamics, and how these same natural dynamics drive species losses on islands, as well as uh, speciation on islands. Remote islands provide some of the finest natural experiments on earth. They constitute more or less discrete systems of limited size where you can hope to measure the inputs, outputs, and internal system state and dynamics. There are lots of them uh, to provide replication, and nature allows us to pick the right selection to test particular ideas, make deductions, and draw inferences. I think Charles Darwin put his finger on it in this observation when he wrote the natural history of this archipelago is very remarkable. It seems to be a little world within itself. Even before Darwin, the German father and son naturalists, Johann Reinhold Foster and George Foster made these simple but fundamental observations in their accounts of James Cook's second Pacific voyage of 1772 to 1775. And since then, Hundreds of studies have been published on the form of what we call the Island Species Area Relationship, or ISAR for short, and how this relationship varies with geographical isolation from mainland sources. And I'm just going to start with a little bit of um, fairly simple ecological theory, and we're going to move to evolutionary stuff a little later. In the 1960s, Robert MacArthur and Edward Wilson developed their equilibrium theory in large part to explain these patterns and island diversity. And they reasoned that starting with a hypothetical empty island, such an island will be showered with propagules of plants and animals, but with their number and diversity decreasing with distance from the source pool. So over time, as species establish breeding populations on them, empty island, the proportion of new arrivals by immigration, this is the ones representing species new to the islands, seeds that arrive or propagules, the, the ones that aren't already there, this proportion uh, will decrease ultimately to reach zero if all the species in the pool were to arrive. However, as the diversity builds up on the island, competition for resources and the general tendency of all communities to contain relatively few ecological dominant species means that as richness of species rises on an island, there must be increasing numbers of very rare ones. And many of these rare populations will fail, the species going locally extinct, disappearing from the island. And so the two curves, the immigration curve and the extinction curve that I'm showing you here, labeled I and E, they uh, eventually intersect, they, they, um, they move together to approach an equilibrium, as shown in these green boxes. So if you integrate the immigration and extinction curves, taking just one of the curves for immigration and one of the curves for extinction from the left-hand box, you get something like this, and this gives you the colonization curve. 
So the number of species on an island through time should increase in a simple way towards an equilibrium. Extinction rate rises more slowly the larger the island, as larger islands have more space and more resources. So in a nutshell, that is MacArthur and Wilson's uh, equilibrium theory. But I should mention that they did also consider speciation in situ on the island as an important additional mechanism for creating diversity on islands. Now this simple model predicts that when islands reach equilibrium, there'll be a strong relationship between island area and richness, and that more isolated systems should have steeper slopes. So it is not possible, as it is not possible to gain and sustain so many species. In particular, it is hard to be very rare on a remote island and actually persist. There is just no local source to restock from. And Wilson's ant data, which I've shown on the right here, Melanesian ants, illustrates this. And Subsequent work has allowed a fuller theory of ISARs to be developed. So his data show the steep line for the islands of Melanesia and the flat line is for the uh, mainland. In fact, it's from the island of, of New Guinea itself. It's different bits of New Guinea, but we treat that as mainland. So if you are not isolated, you have a flat relationship and a high intercept. And if you're very isolated and have a lot of speciation going on, you have a, and have a steeper relationship. So I'm going to return to this theory um, much later, but for the now, the key, th the key thing to note here is that systems of Darwinian islands, which is the name we give archipelagos where in situation, in situ speciation contributes a really big proportion of the species. These are projected to have the steeper slopes and the lowest intercepts. And of course, the hint uh, is that being a generalization, it often fails. And the interesting question becomes, why does it fail and what is the role of evolutionary dynamics in the form of these relationships? So let's put a little bit more um, biology uh, into this. I should, I should have added there that um, as isolation is increasing, we're going from the top of the slide, the rescue effect systems through MacArthur Wilson down to the, the speciation dominated ones. So that's uh, not just increasing richness, increasing uh, isolation. Now let's, let's put some, uh, a bit more biology into it. Because when island biotas assemble, they don't do so entirely in a random way as we were perhaps assuming in the previous slide. First, we have what we might consider as the dispersal filter. And with increasing isolation, fewer species have the propensity to reach uh, a particular island, simply because they lack the necessary adaptations to long distance dispersal. And this weeds out many taxa. Although in fact, a remarkable number of species without clear adaptations to long distance dispersal just get lucky. And if we consider a plant, the seed, despite lack of uh, attraction to birds, may be eaten by a lizard. And the lizard, just by chance, is eaten by a bird of prey. And the bird of prey happens to fly to the remote island and defecates the seed inside the pellet of bones. On the whole though, uh, without long distance adaptations, it's pretty tough to get to remote islands. So that's the dispersal filter. Second, we have the environment filter. Arriving at the wrong destination means failure to establish. The climate, habitat, substrate, etc., must be right. Third, we have in situ speciation. And once arrived on remote islands, some species find empty niche space around them and speciate to occupy these vacant niches. Again, I simplify here, but bear with me. So the pool of species that's available dictates the options, the dispersal and environmental filters determine who gets there and establishes, and evolution then takes over in shaping the eventual composition and diversity. And all the while, new species can arrive and some established ones fail leading to turnover of membership continuing throughout. So let's have a look at an ecological scale example. Island assembly is a dynamic process. It involves some biology, but islands themselves are dynamic. They too come and go, and sometimes the process, as illustrated by the history of the Krakatoa Islands, 
is far from smooth. So let's look at this system, a really dynamic one on ecological timescales, by which I mean those scales of time that match our own experience and lifetimes. And then we'll, having dealt with Krakatoa, a fairly simple system in a sense, we'll move to much more complicated evolutionary dynamics. So Krakatoa, the old Krakatoa, blew in August 1883, and it's situated um, in a particularly dynamic part along the Sunda Straits. It's where the red arrow is on this map, marking a highly active zone, a sort of inflection point along the boundary between the Eurasian plate and the subducting Indo-Australian plate, where, the, where there's a subduction rate of about seven centimeters per annum. And it changes from perpendicular along the line of Java to oblique along Sumatra. So this makes Krakatoa a particularly uh, active point tectonically. And as I already mentioned, it blew in August 1883, and two thirds of the main island that then existed, which is shown by the dotted line in the inset here, disappeared in a major caldera collapse event in which 36,000 people living on coastal uh, Java and Sumatra either side of the Sunda Strait perished. And at Krakatoa, which you see in the middle of the caldera here, appeared only in uh, 1930, following renewed activity in the center of the caldera. So the islands after the 1883 eruptions were completely sterilized, leaving all three reshaped and covered in a 40 to 60 meter depth of fine volcanic ash, as shown by these paintings from uh, 1883, from people who went to the island, as you can see, uh, did some survey work there very, very early on. And there was huge scientific interest in Krakatoa. Biological surveys began in the months immediately after the event. And they've continued through intermittent, if rather unstandardized, but nonetheless, really invaluable survey efforts ever since. And from all these studies that have taken place now over more than a hundred years, we can begin to uh, categorize the flora and fauna of the islands in various different ways. And a really interesting way of doing this is to focus on plant dispersal. Plants arrive by a combination of all the measures uh, and mechanisms shown on this slide, uh, and a few um, that have also been introduced by occasional human visitors to Krakatoa, but I'll, I'll set those on one side. And based on surveys of the flora over time and a variety of forms of evidence, some of which have been a bit indirect, some have been very direct, uh, measurements of seed handling by particular animals and so forth, we can construct the following uh, chronology. Um, and I put it's worth mentioning the gold colony on Surtsea. It's a really interesting comparative system. Um, but actually, I'm not going to say anything about that, so you could ask me about it at the end. So here's Krakatoa um, in 1883. And the arrows uh, here, and in the next two slides, the width of these arrows corresponds directly to the number of colonists in each time slice. So early on, between the 1883 eruption and sterilization and around 1900, the strand lines of the islands were quickly colonized by floating seeds and fruits of typical beach and strand line species of the region. For these species, such islands are not isolated at all. But in the interior, it's rather different. The first pioneers were just a handful of xerophytic ferns and weedy grasses and herbs scarcely any zoochorus or animal dispersed species arrived in these first 15 years or so. So we move to phase two. The supply of new beach species, as you can see from the arrow widths here, begins to decline over the next two decades, as do both the rate of arrival of wind dispersed herbs and ferns. And now we begin to see the first true bird and bat dispersed plants arriving. First colonizing at the back of the beaches, benefiting 
from the attraction of some coastal plants that use two modes of dispersal, having fruit that can float and remain viable in seawater, but which also provide a reward to passing birds or bats. These species of plants call out to passing birds and bats through their smell, and the, these animals stop by to feed, depositing new seeds of purely animal dispersed species in their dropping. So between 1910 and 1930, sewer chorus plants, mostly shrubs and trees, were spread rapidly through the interiors of the islands. So now phase three. So that by uh, 1930, when the new volcano appears, Alec Krakatoa, the older islands are more or less entirely forest covered. Bird or bat dispersed species then continue to be introduced through the following decades. And some of them have got quite large. As you can see, I'm standing in the middle of a, uh, a large strangler fig there uh, about 20 years ago, mind you. Uh, and we see in the uh, arrows here a resurgence of immigration amongst ferns. But now they're forest ferns, many epiphytic. They were waiting for the habitat to appear. And we see a similar resurgence amongst the rate of arrival of wind dispersed, higher plants, also mostly uh, forest epiphytes such as orchids. At this stage, scarcely any new arrivals are turning up on the now eroding beaches. The strand lines are in effect full. So critical to the build-up in general and to key transitions in state are just a handful of the bird species, especially these large fruit pigeons, which bring in the larger seeded forest trees. And perhaps three of the five fruit bat species now known from the islands. The fruit bats only do long distance disperse, in fact, of a small number of small seeded fruit species because they swallow the seeds only accidentally. You can see some of them on the bottom of this uh, bat here. Uh, they uh, are though very important because they're sole dispersers of some of the key early pioneering fig trees, which are crucial to the early stages of forest formation. And this process has been repeated on Anak Krakatoa, the new volcano, where the first two fig species found were both bat dispersed pioneering species. The capacity, as first shown by Louise Shilton's work on this system, of fruit bats to retain viable seeds in the gut overnight means that we have previously underestimated their potential to repopulate really remote sites 40 or more kilometers away from source areas as they forage and as they switch roosting locations. Fruit bats, which also have important roles as pollinators, really are ecologically significant animals in these tropical forest island systems. In addition, Tracy Parrish's work on gene flow in a handful of Krakatoa tree species suggests there is so much movement of seeds going on that we can consider Krakatoa to be part of the same population or metapopulation as nearby sites in both Java and Sumatra, which are about 30 to 40 kilometers away, at least for some tree species. And this is exemplified here by another of the bats dispersed figs, in which the dashed lines indicate no difference between populations. Thus, while an ocean gap of 30 kilometers may be unbridgeable for some species, for others it is no real barrier. So the chances of speciation on such a nearshore island are slim in the extreme. Given the complexities of the successional processes involved, the time for trees to mature, die, be replaced, competition to play out, it is no surprise that Krakatoa failed to equilibrate within the first century of the 1883 cataclysm. And the plots of immigration rates and extinction rates shown here have little similarity to those idealized curves of MacArthur and Wilson I showed you earlier. The big kinks in these curves show rises in extinction as the open habitats disappeared, followed by increased immigration into the maturing forests and a decline in extinction as the carrying capacity of the system increases over the following decades because of these facilitating processes. 
in the early, um, and that's another photo of me, by the way, in the middle of an ash uh, clouded forest. Now, in the early 1990s, Mark Bush and I argued that the Krakatoa system might never fully equilibrate because the biological processes take too long. And before they settle, new eruptions are likely to reset the system back to an earlier stage, even if not uh, achieving a complete re-sterilization. And we showed this in this uh, diagram we published some years ago of a sort of wavy immigration and extinction rate uh, pairing, never quite intersecting because of huge environmental uh, disturbances that we hypothesize might happen. It highlights the uncertainties inherent in such a dynamic setting rather than making clear predictions. But in fact, in December 2018, as you may remember, something along these lines actually happened with eruptions leading to a flank collapse of Anak Krakatoa, which lost half its area, generating a mini tsunami, which caused over 300 deaths, uh, sadly, on the mainlands. And it also um, completely self-sterilized Anak Krakatoa itself. And you can just about see that on the, the right-hand side of the image where the lines go through, where there's just a brown uh, splodge where Anak Krakatoa is, it's lost all the green. And the island of Panjang in the top right has lost its entire foliage. It's completely defoliated by this eruption with an unknown, unknown number of species extinctions following. And the opportunity for a proper resurvey, I'm afraid, has not yet been taken. But it's, it's sort of corresponding roughly with the sort of ideas we were putting out. <clears throat> so having worked on uh, Krakatoa for some two decades, you can understand the importance of geodynamics for the biological dynamics of islands was fairly ingrained in my thinking when I began to work with new networks of colleagues across several European countries, initially fostered by EU funding. But I'd like to make my starting point for the island evolution part of this talk, the figure on the left here, which shows how the contribution of in situ evolution, speciation, to island biotas increases towards the outer edge of the dispersal limits of the taxon, uh, which is termed the radiation zone by MacArthur and Wilson. Um, and we also see that it's the combination of large and, and isolated, which brings with it the highest degree of endemism. So let's go back to uh, Darwin for a moment. And the image on the right here shows just one possible evolutionary tree of the relationships amongst his uh, finches, the Galapagos finches. And Darwin was right, of course, they are a clade descended from a single ancestral colonist finch. And here are just four short excerpts from two pages of the origin of species. And let's consider what he had to say. First, he noted that these species of finches were all closely related and were distinct from other species elsewhere which made sense from the perspective of the idea of species being mutable and evolving, descending from a common ancestor. And that's an isolated stated statement. It, it's in line with uh, Tobler's first law of geography, which came much later, uh, which states that everything is related to everything else, but near things more so the more distant things. Darwin is also pointing to the importance of arrival from a distant source, followed by movements between the islands within the archipelago and of natural se selection, working to favor the development of different varieties, uh, which again may move. So this is identifying, or moving us towards identifying the concepts of single island endemism and of multi-island endemism, and leads us towards the idea of the island progression rule, which, which came much later and which states that young islands tend to give their species, to gain their species from older islands, so that new species evolve in turn on younger and younger islands in the archipelago sequentially. Next, I would like to uh, show you some data for plant endemism within an oceanic uh, archipelago where I've done a certain amount of work in the last few years, the Canary Islands. Here we have many, many lineages of plants, 
and again, a high level of endemism. And I'm just going to take you through some patterns which I love to show in these, in these talks. So these, this is a map of uh, the islands of the Canaries, uh, and you can see the island ages in the slightly blue boxes uh, in millions of years. So the oldest islands are towards the east. If you look at the uh, figures in white boxes, the top figure is the number of single island endemics. That's the number of plants found only on that one island. And underneath in brackets, the number of Canarian endemics, those endemic to the archipelago. And what you see is it's the intermediate aged islands that have most endemics, not the oldest. And you also see another interesting pattern, which if you, if you look for species that are endemic to two islands, the only combinations of two island endemics you get are the next adjacent island along in the chain. Let's extend that to three island combinations. Here is one pattern of five endemic species, three, uh, eight endemic species, and nine, and you'll see there are always the adjacent combinations of ants, a further five species, a further four, a further five. So actually, the numbers of shared endemics are comparatively low. It's telling us that most endemic species are endemic to just one island. Why is that? There's a question. And I think these patterns throw up all sorts of interesting uh, thoughts and observations. Nice patterns then, um, and strongly su suggestive of dispersal limitation or some form of local filtering factor stopping the spread of endemics that may have arisen on one island from moving to others. And so here I've got another excerpt from Hooker, a friend and colleague of Darwin, in a lecture made shortly after the publication of The Origin of Species. This quote highlights awareness amongst these uh, 19th century scientists that island configurations can change. And both Hooker and Darwin realized that land could subside. Darwin's first paper was on coral reef uh, formation through land subsidence, in fact. But Hooker, unlike Darwin, had brought into the ideas of extensionism. Extensionism was the idea that very large land bridges had once existed to stock many islands by connecting them to mainlands right across uh, the oceans. Darwin was rightly highly skeptical of extensionism and emphasized instead the powers of long distance dispersal to stock uh, distant islands. And this dichotomy uh, between uh, events that form barriers and long distance dispersal has run as disputes throughout biogeography, biogeography uh, ever, ever since. Now, both were right to a degree, but in fact, Hooker was much less so and in more restricted contexts than was Darwin. So most distant islands are indeed populated by long distance dispersal. <clears throat> and the other remarkable thing here is this final excerpt here. It re uh, he's talking about um, species disappearing, and he talks about uh, the kinds of insects to whose activity the fertilizing process in plants, and hence their propagation, is so largely due. Well, what is this? It is the loss of species at one trophic level, leading to the loss of others at a different trophic level. This is what we would call an ecological cascade. And Hooker was talking about this in the middle of the uh, 19th century. It's not a modern idea at all. Isn't that wonderful? Now, back then, of course, we, we not only had yet to discover Mendelian genetics and DNA, but they had no um, plate tectonic theory, which was accepted only in the late 1960s. And we now know the ocean crust to be mostly very young, and most, most oceanic islands to be younger still. The Hawaiian islands exemplify this as they are hotspot islands where the plate moves along a hot spot in the mantle with islands forming intermittently atop the hot spot. And then they're carried away to erode and subside. And this process has been going on for some uh, 75 million years, although the, uh, the oldest high island in the chain today is only about 5 million years of age. Um, 
you've noted perhaps I'm showing Madeira and Canaries, in fact, in this slide in the box, and they've been doing much the same thing in this part of the Atlantic and for almost as long. But the ocean plate in this part of the world is thicker, and so the subsidence is less pronounced and the islands last longer. So we've got um, a dynamic here. And what I want to ask is, what happens if we intersect um, island ecological theory, island evolutionary theory, and a contemporary knowledge of the ontogeny or life cycle of oceanic islands? So here I'm showing you a, a very simplified textbook representation after a diagram by Patrick Nunn of the development of an oceanic hotspot island from a subsurface seamount in panel A through to an initially um, simple volcanic form in B, etc., etc., through the sides, increasing complexity as erosion and continued volcanism go to work on this initial form. Eventually, we end up with an in inactive island which is eroding and subsiding and all that topographic complexity is lost. And we end up with a very low elevation island which will either persist in certain waters as low atolls or will slip below the waves to become a seamount again. So how common are these uh, hotspot archipelagos? Well, it turns out they're really common. Um, and uh, here I've shown you the Hawaiian Islands in the top right, by the way. The oldest island is in the top left of that image, and the youngest, Hawaii itself, is in the bottom right. Um, so they're really common, uh, these sorts of um, dynamic hotspot systems. Here's a, a slightly better image in the, in the Pacific, in which you can see uh, not everything out there in the Pacific is hotspot. Some are associated with plate boundaries, but there's an awful lot of hotspot uh, islands. So um, what happens then if we integrate the biological dynamics, taking inspiration from MacArthur and Wilson, with this simple island ontogeny? This is what we attempted to do in what we call the general dynamic model of oceanic island biogeography, in a paper published uh, in 2008. Uh, and uh, discussed in many uh, subsequent papers. So first of all, consider the potential carrying capacity of our island, our hotspot island. I'm going to call that K, carrying capacity. And it's for all life on the island that I'm thinking of carrying capacity. It will increase as the size and the elevation of the island increases, gaining multiple ecosystem types and resource space. As the topography increases in complexity, each major habitat will be subdivided, potentially allowing different species to win in different massifs across the island. And as the island erodes and, subsided and subsides again, the island's K must decline eventually to zero as the island disappears. We have a remote island, so immigration is fairly low, and it samples just the limited subset of the most dispersive members of the continental source pool. So while species richness gradually builds, it can't meet the carrying capacity. There is uncontested niche space. And there is something else, of course, going on to fill that gap, and that is in situ evolutionary diversification, which you might call cladogenesis, the division of clades. This takes some time and requires a decent number of starter lineages not all of which will diversify. Partly, that is a matter of the dispersal powers of the taxon we're considering. If we have a taxon of relatively poor dispersers, which have nonetheless managed to get there, we expect fewer inter-island colonists, uh, less gene flow, and more speciation. If we have, um, there we go, so more speciation because they're slower to get there. If we have very dispersive organisms, they get there at a faster rate, there might be some, something like bryophytes, we expect to see more colonists, relatively speaking, more gene flow and less speciation. So that's the model 
but I haven't yet added in uh, the extinction rate. So let's clean up and have a, a simpler version uh, of this figure. And now I've added the extinction rate. So the extinction rate um, begins to rise as the island fills up. And it really accelerates when the island's carrying capacity starts to go down. And we lose major habitats and lots of resources and internal isolation. And gradually we're forcing uh, the diversity of the island down. It's becoming harder and harder to speciate and more and more species uh, are lost. Eventually, extinction rate itself declines as there are fewer species to go extinct. You will also see in this slide, we added a sort of Krakatoa-like phase of slow immigration rate to start with because we're in a spin-up phase of the ecology and the islands are very dynamic and eruptive. So this is a model that we can modify to capture more complex dynamics and we can use it to generate predictions of how island systems may behave over time. And we can ma model it uh, mathematically. Now, of course, hotspot islands provide a conveyor belt of islands appearing and disappearing, as per the image on the right. Now, here I would like you to focus in on that old dying island, the second panel from the right. In its heyday, it produced its own endemic species. So jump to the little boxes at the top the butterfly image. So one of these species from this oldest island has colonized the next youngest island with further opportunities for within island speciation. And then you get colonization in turn to the next youngest island down the chain until we get to the very youngest one where that whole process is just starting again. So in fact, most colonists, the youngest island in an archipelago, are going to come not from the mainland, but from older islands. And this produces the island progression rule, in which younger species are typically descendants of the next oldest uh, island along. And this rule applies to many of the lineages that arrived early on an archipelago. So let me just uh, take you through that uh, again in terms of what an evolutionary tree might hypothetically look like. There's our first stage of an island, and as it ages, it becomes more complex. There's more speciation that's taking place. We get more uh, endemics. Um, but we're also getting colonization now of another island that's popped up out of the sea, where the whole process repeats. Run the system longer, and now we're seeing uh, that on our oldest island, a lot of the lineages are dying out, which are indicated by the red dashed lines here. We've got fewer survivals, survivors, they're more, they're more distantly um, linked on the tree. And as we move along the chain, we see that replication of the process. Now, all of that means that we can make predictions about the diversity patterns across islands and also the structure of evolutionary trees across uh, archipelagos. So let me just give you a couple of examples here of the progression rule. Uh, this is data from very old data from drosophilids and from silver swords. And you can see that generally speaking, most of the uh, inferred colonization events shown in these arrows are from the older to younger islands with very few back colonization events. And this seems to be a dominant, although not universal uh, pattern. Now, the general dynamic model provides this framework for thinking about island evolutionary dynamics, but it also makes predictions about diversity patterns we can see today. And building on uh, previous theory, it predicts that diversity will increase with island area in a fairly simple way. But that is um, conditioned by the stage each island has reached in its life cycle. A young growing island will have fewer species and a lower proportion of single island endemics than an old subsiding one that is reduced to the same area but having experienced all that build up of diversity all that cladogenesis and is now seeing a collapse of diversity but some islands um, at maturity are going to be larger than others so if we analyze snapshot data across a whole archipelago at once what we expect to see from the gdm is a humped relationship with island age and a linear one um, with island area. And this happens to fit uh, 
a high proportion of Oceanic Island data for which we've tested the model. Here I'm showing you data for canary and arthropods and for plants from the uh, Galapagos. And here you see those same hump-shaped relationships for land snails, which are not very good at getting around the islands once they get there for various reasons. But on the right-hand side here, we see that bryophytes, which are very much more dispersive, you can fit a hump-shaped model um, for, for island age, which is still the, um, the, the, the right-hand axis at the bottom, um, but you don't really need the hump. So they're not really doing that uh, hump-filling thing so much because they're too dispersive. So um, let's look a little bit more at now at uh, a couple of uh, lineages that are doing this sort of uh, diversification across islands. And one of the very um, best examples is this uh, study of Hawaiian Bidens, a member of the Asteraceae or Daisy family. Um, and it's one of the um, fastest examples of diversification in the plant world. But if you study it per unit area, these insular radiations are as fast as you seem to be able to find anywhere. There's fast or faster per unit area than um, the, the fastest diversifying uh, mainland uh, lineages. Although we might note here actually that uh, if you look at systems like the Andean lupinus, lupins of the Andes, they're also island systems of a sort. And they also boast um, the, the high Andes, the most exceptional diversity and high rates of speciation for birds, uh, for mammal, mammals, uh, and for amphibians. And if you're interested in this, uh, do follow up some recently published work in science by Carsten Rabeck and, and colleagues on these mountain biodiversity patterns. Those mountains are islands too. Now, um, Givnish, gives another spectacular system, this time of lobeliads from Hawaii. And it's probably the largest radiation uh, in the plant world from any single colonist on any archipelago. So these, uh, these plants arrived as a single species colonist about 15 million years ago uh, on an island that since disappeared. The diversification probably played a key role in developing keystone mutualisms and rates of diversification in uh, Drosophilids, for example. So all of this actually, I would say, fits with our general uh, dynamic model. These are the lineages that fill the hump in our model system. Now you may have spotted that the general dynamic model is very simplistic, uh, particularly in its, its uh, representation of carrying capacity over time. And a rather different trajectory of carrying capacity variation is needed for other, other island types, such as plate margin islands, as sketched out uh, here originally in work by Larry Heaney. I'm not going to talk about that anymore, but it's just to say you can and do need to modify it. Another form of modification is to take account of past sea level change. And sea levels have fluctuated enormously in the last 2.6 million years, the quaternary, and have reached as low as 135 meters below current base levels. In this particular paper, Sitsi Nordi and colleagues tested whether we get improved diversity models for archipelagos by including in our regression models, either the current uh, island configurations or those from the absolute lowest sea level of the Pleistocene or some intermediate but longer lasting low sea level uh, model. Uh, and the answer is that we do best for single island endemic species uh, diversity predictions if we include the low, lowered sea levels that are most prevalent, the longest lasting low sea levels from the Pleistocene. Uh, and that's uh, shown in the panels on the left where the biggest bars are for the variables showing change in area and paleo connectedness. But for native species, we, we don't need these paleo uh, variables at all. They're well explained by contemporary uh, variables. So this suggests that when you look at endemics, not surprisingly, they show legacies from past variation in island configuration. Um, 
so this slide shows uh, re results of that study, and I now want to move to another um, in preparation uh, study. Uh, this is um, some work we're doing at the moment on the distribution of the floor of the Canary Islands. It's the same uh, islands that we were looking at those maps uh, earlier on for. Now, diversity patterns of endemics are critical to the overall diversity profiles and patterns, the filling in of those humps we were looking at uh, across oceanic islands. So this work was uh, undertaken by Jose Marie Fernandez Palacios, uh, Rudy, Otto, and several other uh, colleagues and myself. Um, and I think they show something really, really interesting. Within the flora, those species that have established but not diversified, so that they are either simply natives or become endemic without splitting into uh, more than one species within our archipelago. These non-diversified species are often found on all seven islands. Certainly over half of them are found on five or more of the, of the seven islands, and they provide the bulk of the widely uh, distributed species. In many cases, their failure to diversify, to be evolutionarily successful in one way, is a sign of their success in becoming an abundant and widespread within the archipelago. They can move around well, gene flow is good, they do not exhibit uh, cladogenesis. And it's the species in diversified lineages, and especially the most highly diversified, diversified lineages, that tend to be single island endemics. We've also found, when doing further work, which I'm, I, I can't show today, that these um, species in the best diversifying lineages tend to have small within island distributions, relatively narrow realized niches, and to be locally abundant only in rocky or high elevation communities like, like those uh, shown here. Now perhaps some of these species in the fullness of time and with luck will do, will do better they'll get to escape their insular prisons and become widespread and successful. But more likely, most will founder as the islands founder, or through more localized disasters, such as the huge uh, flank collapses that occur from time to time. The most recent being the collapse of half of the Canarian island of El Hierro in the El Golfo landslide about 13 and a half thousand years ago. So while these plants may develop impressive local adaptations, it isn't necessarily enough to provide uh, longevity to the species. Now, I know I've not got much more time, but I just want to tie up some threads now. So right at the start, I showed you this species area plot and the generalized model at the top left. And, we sh and it showed that the lowest uh, intercepts and steeper slopes are for Darwinian islands speciation is dominant. I said there were exceptions. And in the 2019 paper, we analyzed how the slope and intercept describing this relationship vary as the overall richness of the archipelago increases. This is to view the archipelago as its own mini province, where the islands predominantly supply each other with candidate species, which we see now is a reasonable assumption. And what we can see here is that for a given archipelago richness shown by the size of these bubbles, there is a range of C and Z value combinations. So there's a sort of trade-off. And as Z increases, C must get smaller. And as the archipelago richness increases, this negative slope-intercept relationship still applies, but the value of both increases. So why is this trade-off occurring? Why isn't there a single slope and intercept for a given taxon, for a given overall archipelago, archipelago diversity? Why is it that some uh, remote oceanic island systems depart from this nice red line I've shown in the top slide? Well, we thought it's probably to do with variation factors such as isolation from the mainland, um, it could be the effect of throwing in studies of birds and beetles and land sales all in one big analysis. And it could have something to do with island configuration, which are my blue shaded variables here. So we constructed a model 
the models on the top left and the fit is on the bottom right. And the important thing about this is that what they show is that isolation from the mainland, although it's an important factor, it doesn't, it's not important enough to show up in these models. There's taxon effects as we expected. Gamma diversity is important, the overall richness of the archipelago. But crucial to understanding the variation is the configuration of the archipelago, which as we know, is dynamic over time. So let me try just to pull these things uh, together in the last slide. Um, as the archipelago isolation increases, in general, we move from systems dominated by uh, dispersal, with species populations constantly rescued from extinction, to those which comply with MacArthur and Wilson's measurable ecological turnover, to those dominated by speciation, in which colonization is rare, and so we're seeing um, lots of speciation. But the islands within an archipelago supply one another. So as you vary the effective isolation within an archipelago, you modify these expected steep slopes in much the same as we expect to see with the increasing distance from mainland source pools. And in scanning the island literature, we can see the effects of mixing up all of these forms of variation, distance to mainland, distance to other archipelagos, within archipelagos, size range, age range of islands, climate types, all of these things, different taxa. And all of these factors bring in so much um, noise and, and variation that we rarely find perfect fits for any one model of diversity. And in fact, we can often test for the effects of several theorized uh, um, factors and, and processes. And there's lots of hypotheses I've not covered. This is the island species energy hypothesis, the habitat diversity hypothesis. These, the ones I have covered, like the general model of uh, the dynamic, general dynamic model and the sea level models. We can test these models on the same data sets. And very often we find meaningful chunks of variation being explained by these competitor models. They eat, there's each signal there of each of them, but none of them is explaining uh, everything in one hit. Now, it is my belief uh, that all of these emergent patterns of archipelago diversity and of island uh, phylogenies can be woven together into a coherent narrative integral to which is that the dynamics of, of the islands themselves strongly influence the biological uh, dynamics played out within archipelagos. And I think the, the early naturalists probably saw this and, and at some point we slightly forgot to think about it. Um, in conclusion, I think as, as Darwin foresaw, um, the, st the continued uh, study of islands will, will uh, continue to provide all of us with uh, inspiration and, and fantastic uh, model systems. So I'm going to uh, finish there. I'd like to thank so many of you for staying all the way through this uh, presentation. Um, and I look forward to any questions that you've channeled through Sandy uh, in however long we've got to do it. Thank you very much, Robert. That was a fascinating lecture. And I'm sure that were we in the rooms in Burlington House, both Charles Darwin and Joseph Dalton Hooker would be looking down from their portraits on the walls on the meeting room in Burlington House um, with great joy at hearing about their beloved islands.